Good morning and welcome to the third meeting of the Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee for 2019. Um, may I ask anyone in the public gallery to turn their phone to silent or off so it doesn't interfere with proceedings. And item one on the agenda is a, dis a decision by the committee to take items four, five and six in private. Are we agreed? Yes. Thank you. We turn now to the Damages, Investment Returns and Periodical Payments Scotland Bill, and we are now at Stage 2, and uh, I'll welcome the Minister for Community Safety, Ash Denham, who joins us this morning, uh, along with um, her team, Alex Gordon, Scott Matheson, Jill Clark and Francis McQueen. So we'll move um, straight to item 2 on the agenda, which is the amendments at stage two uh, for the damages, investment, returns and period periodical payments Scotland bill. So I'll first of all call amendment one in the name of the minister. Sorry, sorry. Can we just can we start with that first bit, please? Okay, sorry, my clerks uh, have corrected me <laughs> to say the, 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 the first bit I'm to start with is the question is that sections one and two be agreed to. Are we all agreed as there are no amendments proposed to these sections? Yes. Agreed. Yes. Um, I will now turn to the Minister and uh, call on her to uh, move uh, amendment one, which is grouped with amendments two, three, four, five and six. And I'll ask the Minister to speak to all amendments in that group. So, Minister. Thank you, Convener, and good morning to the Committee. So, currently, there is no statutory requirement for the discount rate to be reviewed regularly. And it's clear that a lack of that regular review is detrimental to all parties. And in consultation, most consultees agreed that the rate should be reviewed regularly on occasions that are specified in legislation. Whilst taking account of the views of respondents, the Scottish Government decided that a review should be carried out every three years, with the possibility of a review being instigated earlier if circumstances were to point to that need. And this would provide a significant degree of certainty, but also tempered with a proportionate degree of flexibility. Stakeholders have suggested that with the three-year review, settlement of cases may be delayed if one or other party anticipates a more favourable rate coming into force, and they argue that a five-year review period would go some way to address this issue that's sometimes known as gaming. I've always maintained that the Scottish Government's imperative is that reviews are regular. And as I outlined in my response to the Stage 1 report during the Stage 1 debate, I've listened carefully to those that gave evidence and also to the conclusion of the committee that in the interests of finding the balance between flexibility and certainty, that five years would be preferable to three. And these amendments therefore alter the frequency of review from every three years to every five, but the facility to call for an out of cycle review remains. And I move Amendment 1, Convener. Very well. Um, as no members have indicated they wish to speak on this, um, I think, Minister, do you, do you wish to wind up or shall we simply go straight to the I vote think on it? We should go straight to the vote, yes. Thank you. So the question is that Amendment 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. And the second question is, uh, I will call Amendments 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6, all in the name of the Minister and uh, spoken to by the Minister. And I would invite the Minister to move Amendments 2 to 6 on block. I move, Convener. Um, does any member object to a single question being put on Amendments 2 to 6? Uh, if not, in that case, the question is that amendments two to six are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. I now move to um, amendment 11 in the name of Jackie Bailey, which is grouped with amendment 13 in the name of Dean Lockhart. So I'll turn first of all to Jackie Bailey to move amendment uh, 11 and speak to both amendments in the group. Thank you very much, Convener. Um, I have pleasure in moving Amendment 11 in my name and will speak to the others in the group. Um, I think it, it was recognised by the, the Minister as well that injured people aren't necessarily ordinary investors. In fact, um, I think we would agree most 
wouldn't invest in the, the stock market and where they do, they are likely to be quite risk adverse. Um, and I recognise that the Scottish Government has tried to get the balance right, but we need to be sure as a committee that all the assumptions about deductions are accurate, as any award will of course be for the rest of that person's life. So Amendment 11 in my name seeks to address an area where I think the Government has underestimated the cost of taxation and in investment advice. The Association of Personal Injury Lawyers, um, whom the committee did in fact take evidence from at stage one, highlighted their concerns that the adjustments in Schedule B1 need to reflect as closely as possible the costs incurred by the pursuer. And I've had an opportunity to re reflect further since the stage one report. And let me point to the following pieces of evidence in support of my amendment. Firstly, the government's actuary department, um, their own analysis showed um, reasonable allowances for expenses and tax anywhere between 0 0.5 and 2%. Now, I know the Scottish Government preferred the lower um, end of that spectrum, but they stress in evidence given to the committee that a larger adjustment could be plausibly justified. Richard Cropper, the personal, from Personal Financial Planning, um, put the estimate at 1.5 to 2% because he believes that the Scottish Government figure is materially underestimated. Um, Paul Rosson, an independent financial advisor, um, said if the smaller the award, then the closer it's likely to be to 2%. That's just simply for independent advice, not including any tax. And he does recognise that whilst a moderate award would be 0.5% across the industry, it doesn't include any, any tax whatsoever. And finally, um, Graham Lind from Tilney Financial Planning, which is, of course, based in Edinburgh, said the standard kind of rate would be 1% plus VAT, um, and taxation takes the figure north of 1.5% per annum. So in arriving at 1.5%, I've tried to give recognition to the broad range of factors there and the general consensus, whether it's from the government's actuary department to the range of financial advisors, indicates that 0.5% is perhaps just a shade too low um, to cover both taxation and investment advice. Um, so I would pause at that point, um, invite obviously the committee and the minister to agree with me um, and... Uh, conclude my comments at this stage. Thank you. I'll now turn to Dean Lockhart and ask him to speak to Amendment 13. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, Amendment 13 in my name would uh, change the further margin adjustment from 0.5% to 0.25%. Uh, in its uh, policy memorandum, the government made clear that the further margin adjustment is to reduce the, the risk of undercompensation in certain cases. However, the policy memorandum also states that as a result of this new further margin adjustment, there will, and I quote, inevitably be a probability of overcompensation. Uh, many stakeholders therefore see this as a departure from the principle of 100% compensation. Uh, damages, the underlying principle is that damages have the purpose of placing the injured person insofar as possible in the position they would have been, save for the injury uh, incurred, and the courts are very careful at the beginning in setting the level of compensation at a level which is likely to meet future financial losses and care costs. Uh, this legislation we're uh, debating is not intending to or, or designed to revisit the basic principles of restitution, but instead is aimed at making sure the level of compensation as set by the court is adjusted to reflect how the damages may be invested uh, over the longer term. And based on stakeholder uh, feedback, there is a legitimate concern that is drafted at 0.5% as a further margin adjustment. The legislation will change those underlying principles of fair compensation, 100% compensation, and this will come at a cost to the NHS, uh, other public bodies, and poten potentially higher insurance premiums. So as a matter of public policy, uh, while we want to avoid uh, cases of, of undercompensation, I think it's widely recognised that the probability of the further margin adjustment being set at 0.5%, the probability is that this will result in overcompensation, and that comes at a cost, and that is something that we have to recognise. I'll uh, end my remarks there. 
Um, did, did the member wish to say anything about um, Amendment 11 in the name of Jackie Bale? I should have in, uh, invited him to speak on that as well, or has he covered that? In well, well very, very briefly, the, the underlying concern is the same, that if, if we have a 1.5 adjustment in addition to the 100% the compensation, there is a risk uh, that this will end up with the compensation, the quantum of the compensation over the longer term being uh, resulting in overcompensation. I think there is wide recognition that the notional investment portfolio is, is cautious, would largely be made up of passive funds and uh, debt, uh, fixed asset investments, and therefore those types of investments don't require active management, and as a result, uh, those types of investment portfolio usually result in a lower management fee being incurred. So my concern over Amendment 11 would be that we end up uh, revisiting the underlying principles of 100% compensation if we uh, adjust that um, uh, tax and investment charge adjustment to 1.5%. Thank you. And uh, I think uh, John Mason has indicated he would like to speak, and I'll take other members following his comments. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Convener. Um, we've got two amendments here. So firstly, uh, Jackie Bailey's Amendment 11. I mean, I think we ha we've had briefings. Well, obviously, we had the whole uh, all the evidence we got during the uh, report sta stage one report. But I mean, even since then, we've had further briefings which go in opposite directions. The Association of British Insurers uh, want to go one way, and the Association of Personal Injury Lawyers uh, want to go in a different way. And I mean, I think there, there is a real issue here, and I think we did consider it. Um, however, I'm not convinced. I have to say, by Jackie Bailey's um, amendment. Uh, it, it seems to me that if we were to amend it, it would need to be a lot more kind of, if you like, sophisticated. Um, for example, I think we had evidence that at the beginning, people might have greater costs for an investment because they obviously need to take advice from scratch, whereas on an ongoing basis, they, they wouldn't need so much advice, especially if it was a passive uh, investment. So I think that is an issue that uh, could be looked at but I'm not sure it's covered uh, by this amendment. And I think another factor is the size of the settlement, because if it's a very large settlement, you're going to tend to have a smaller percentage in uh, investment advice, and if it's a very uh, small investment, you will tend to have a larger percentage. So I don't feel that uh, we're really improving an awful lot uh, by just making everything 1.5% instead of 0.5%. Uh, and I, th I think the argument, I'm persuaded by the argument that, you know, most investors are probably going to take the passive approach, but if they're going for an active approach and spend a bit more in fees, then over the long term, they should actually be making more of a gain, and that will uh, match out with the extra costs. Um, I'm also not convinced, I have to say, by Amendment 13 uh, from Dean Lockhart. Uh, we did take a lot of evidence, and I think we are all committed to the principle that people should be properly uh, compensated. I think, though, the evidence we had was that inevitably some people will be overcompensated and some people will be undercompensated. And that is always going to be the case, eh, and, and you can never um, get round that, I, I suppose, unless you had a different discount rate for every single in, eh, person. So I think the 0.5%, the it seems to me, is a pretty reasonable figure. Eh, you, you could go higher, you could go lower, but I think eh, uh, on the evidence we heard during the, the stage one, I'm certainly convinced that we should stick to the point five. Thank you. Thank you. Angela Constance. Thank you very much, Convener. Um, like Mr Mason, I would be concerned with respect to Amendment 13 uh, in that, that that may lead to um, uh, uh, pursuers actually being undercompensated. But, I mean, the Minister, of course, will have our, have our own views. Um, in terms of Jackie Bailey's uh, Amendment 11, um, Yes, during stage one evidence, some pursuer representatives did indeed feel that the adjustment may not be enough. I know it was something that committee did test the minister on uh, when she was uh, last here. Um, and I just wonder if, in our uh, closing remarks, um, if, if you know the minister had any thoughts about that, if 1.5% was too high, um, would she, you know, perhaps prior to stage three, consider, you know, 0.75 or point, you know, what one percent, uh, given that there are some concerns around? Thank you. Um, does any other member wish to um, come in at this point? If not, um, I'll 
turn back to the Minister to respond to these comments. Thank you, Convener. And I'm grateful to both Jackie Bailey and to Dean Lockhart for setting out the reasoning behind their respective amendments, although, in fact, they do opposing things. So one would significantly increase the level of damages awarded to a pursuer, and the other would decrease the level of damages. Um, but it probably makes sense for me to address both of them at the same time. So the approach that we've taken in the bill on how the discount rate should be calculated is based on a portfolio which meets the needs of the hypothetical investor as described in the bill. The asset classes and percentage holdings contained in the notional portfolio have been balanced in such a way as to support an approach in terms of investment choices which is capable of limiting volatility and also uncertainty. And that is the starting point. Thereafter, the bill introduces two standard adjustments which the rate assessor must deduct from the rate return that they have arrived at. The first is intended to take account of investment advice, management costs and also taxation. The adjustment is set out on the face of the bill with regulation making powers for Scottish ministers to change the adjustment if required. The Scottish Government accepts that there will be a need to take investment advice and indeed one of the characteristics of the hypothetical investor is that they are properly advised. And Scottish ministers sought views from the Government Actuaries Department on the appropriate level for the adjustment for tax and passive investment management costs. And I think Jackie Bailey raised this in her comments. And whilst GAD considered that the reasonable allowance for expense and tax might fall into the range of 0.5 to 2%, they were also of the view that allowance at the lower end was likely to be more appropriate because of a number of reasons. So it's reasonable to assume that pursuers will shop around to get the most competitive fees. It's reasonable to assume that pursuers will directly invest in passive funds. In the current economic environment, income yields, particularly on bonds, are low, which eases the possible pressure of higher tax charges. And there are further prudence deductions included elsewhere in the discount rate. On the other hand, Amendment 13 alters the second standard adjustment, that of the further margin, by reducing it to 0.25% from 0.5%. And the intention of the further margin is to recognise that any investment, however cautious, does carry some risk, and a proxy cannot take account of an individual's particular circumstances. So as set out in the GAD report, the inclusion of the further adjustment is to improve the chances of the pursuer having sufficient funds to meet their damages. The composition of the portfolio and the level of adjustment, which are set out in the bill, have been very carefully arrived at. They are the result of analysis, actuarial advice, and an analysis of all the available evidence. And I very much welcome the conclusion of the committee, as set out in their stage one report, that they were satisfied with this approach. Altering either the standard adjustments will alter the final discount rate. And in the case of Jackie Bailey's amendment, the impact of increasing the level of adjustment for tax, investment and management costs to 1.5% would be significant. In terms of the illustrative examples that were included in the financial memorandum, it would increase the claim worth 3.6 million to 5.9 million, a claim worth 1.4 million to 2 million, and a claim worth 0.77 million to 0.92 million. The balance would be tipped too far in favour of pursuers and their chances of being overcompensated would increase significantly. And it is defenders who would have to fund these increases, be they private sector businesses or indeed public sector services, such as the National Health Service. So I can't imagine that we would want to place an unwarranted burden on businesses and on our public services any more than we would want to reduce the chances of a pursuer being properly compensated for their injury, which is what Dean Lockhart's amendment would do. And I think it's worth stressing when we talk about over and under compensation that we're talking about the likelihood of it happening or the probability of it happening. So it's not an absolute and there is an element of risk involved for the pursuer, no matter what the award basis is. But the analysis around the distribution of returns generated by the investment portfolio in the bill shows that if the return were not to be adjusted, it would result in a 50% chance of the pursuer being undercompensated and a 50% chance of a pursuer 
being overcompensated. So a 50% chance of undercompensation is, in my view, not acceptable. And that is why a further adjustment is needed in order to reduce the chance of undercompensation. So altering that level of further mar margin downwards would alter the balance of risk faced by the pursuer to their detriment, such that the chances of being undercompensated would increase, in our view, to an unacceptable level. I hope it's of some reassurance that Scottish ministers will review the portfolio and also these adjustments ahead of each regular review. And of course, we will take advice on these matters so that any changes will be the result of professional and also expert advice and also sound analysis. And I would maintain that that is the appropriate approach to take. So both of these amendments undermine the considered and balanced approach that has been adopted in the bill. And so I would urge both Jackie Bailey and Dean Lockhart not to press their amendments. <coughs> Thank you, Minister. I'll turn back to Jackie Bailey for her closing comments or an indication whether she was, wishes to press or withdraw. Thank you very much, Convener. The purpose of my amendment was very specifically based on um, expert advice and professional opinion, um, and indeed the government actuary's own words was really to increase damages to cover taxation um, and investment advice based on the practical experience of, of practitioners. Um, can I remind the Minister that the government actuary actually said and stressed that large adjustments could be plausibly justified. So whilst I understand that she put it at 0.5%, the government actually themselves said it actually could be um, substantially higher. Can I pick up on two members' contributions? Firstly, from Dean Lockhart, and I'm sad to say that Dean Lockhart is entirely wrong. Um, this is about reflecting the real costs of tax and advice. It's based on evidence, it's based on experts, it's based on practitioners with knowledge of what they're doing. Um, and you know, the day of experts has not gone. Um, I think they have been extremely helpful in providing advice to this committee. And of course, it wasn't just at stage one. We've t the, there has been further information provided to committee members, hence the amendments down today. Um, I'm interested in what the minister said about reviewing the portfolio ahead of each regular review. That is welcome. Um, I'd be interested to know, and she doesn't have an opportunity to respond, but perhaps at a later stage, <coughs> who's going to be involved? Is that review set out in statute? Um, and I would be minded um, to consider withdrawing the amendment if the minister was to agree to a discussion before stage three on this issue, and I'm struck by John Mason's um, comments signalling that he would perhaps support a more sophisticated amendment that reflected a variation in costs, and I'm happy to consider that along with him. So if the Minister is willing to agree to a discussion, then, then I would be happy to withdraw Amendment 11. I would encourage the Committee not to support Amendment 13. Uh, Minister, do you wish to respond to that at this stage? Yes, I'm happy to take um, Jackie Bailey up on an offer and we'd be glad to meet with her to discuss this if she's willing to withdraw the amendment at this stage. Happy to do so, convener. Very well. Is there any objection to Jackie Bailey withdrawing that amendment? In that case, we'll move to Amendment 13 in the name of Dean Lockhart, already debated with Amendment 11, and for Dean Lockhart to wind up and to indicate whether he wishes to move or not move his amendment. Uh, thank you, Convener. Very briefly, I think John Mason was right when he said that we had received uh, briefings on both sides of the argument for and against uh, the operation of the further margin adjustments uh, for and against uh, how they m might operate in practice. And I think that reflects the fact that each adjustment can't be viewed in isolation. Uh, they both operate in the same way to adjust uh, the original damages award. The draft bill currently sets out total adjustments of 1%, 0.5% uh, for tax and investment charges, and 0.5% uh, for further margin adjustment, uh, making a total of 1%. Uh, the draft uh, amendment, or the amendment uh, lodged by Jackie Bailey... Just, just intervene. Um, I think it's just a, a brief uh, winding up right. as opposed to a, a general recap of the arguments that we're looking for at this stage and then the indication whether uh, you wish to move or not move your amendment. 
I will not press my amendment uh, for the time being, but I will uh, reserve the ability to revisit Amendment 13, depending on uh, what other amendments are brought forward at Stage 3. Um, is there any objection to uh, Mr Lockhart not moving the amendment at this stage? No. In that case, uh, thank you. <coughs> we then move on to uh, Amendment 7 in the name of the Minister, which is grouped with Amendment 9, and I would ask the Minister to move Amendment 7 and speak to both amendments in the group at this stage. Minister. Thank you, Convener. So we've taken the opportunity at stage two to lodge an amendment in order to improve uh, the readability of the text which introduces the notional investment portfolio in paragraph 12 of the schedule. Amendment seven splits up subparagraph one into two subparagraphs so that some of the text is moved into a new subparagraph 1a following subparagraph one and this comes ahead of the notional investment portfolio itself. The amendment makes some connected adjustments to tidy up the narrative including um, introducing the notional investment portfolio and this amendment is merely of the minor and drafting variety and the overall sense of the text is not altered. The amendment does not make any change whatsoever to the notional investment portfolio which is set out in the table in subparagraph 2. Amendment 9 makes a minor and separate adjustment in the provision for variation or suspension of agreed periodical payments. A reference to injured person replaces uh, the slightly more descriptive wording in section 2H2B2 so as to rely on the nearby definition of injured person. The result is unchanged and the adjustment is consistent with the approach in various other provisions for periodical payments and I move amendment 7. Does any member wish to come in on that amendment? Um, if not, uh, I think, Minister, there's probably no need to come back to wind up, although I'd give you that opportunity if you wished it. Um, in that case, the, the question uh, is, is um, uh, do we agree to Amendment 7? Yes. yes. Thank you. We then move to Amendment 14 in the name of Dean Lockhart. And I would invite Dean Locker to move and speak to Amendment 14. Thank you, Convener. I move Amendment 14 in my name. Uh, this amendment requires the Scottish Government to review the notional portfolio in the bill before every review of the discount rate by the rate setter and to embed the duty to consult uh, stakeholders before doing so in the legislation. Uh, the mix of investments in the notional portfolio is an important part of the framework for setting the uh, discount rate. Given that investment markets are fast moving and the nature of investments change rapidly, it's important that the Scottish Government reviews the mix of investments before each review and consults widely in doing so. That consultation approach will enable the Government to take account of the existing uh, market conditions between reviews and the change in investment practice which will inevitably happen uh, between the five year reviews. Uh, I think the Minister for Community Safety has accepted that the Government will in practice review the notional portfolio before each review anyway. Um, our view is that it would be better for this review to be uh, embedded within the legislation expressly and for the duty to consult to be included also. A formal duty to consult would have the advantage of uh, making this clear and making the process more transparent. I move the amendment. Does any member wish to come in on this particular amendment? Uh, if not, um, I'll give the Minister an opportunity to respond. Thank you, Convener. Um, so it's helpful to hear Dean Lockhart's explanation of the intention behind this amendment. And he's right to say that the Bill currently provides that Scottish Ministers must have regard to the need to ensure that their portfolio remains appropriate. But it may be helpful if I outline the intended process um, ahead of each regular review. So the first review will be carried out on the basis of the portfolio and adjustment figures set out in the Bill. Ahead of the second and subsequent regular reviews, Scottish Ministers will engage with GAD to review whether the portfolio is still appropriate, desk-based research of low-risk portfolios, whether the margins are still appropriate, whether a dual rate is applicable, based on analysis from GAD, commenting on the extent to which investment returns differ over different time periods, whether also the period over which the investment returns are to be assessed should be altered, and whether RPI remains the appropriate inflation measure. 
decisions on any change to the portfolio, the adjustments, the period over which expected returns are based, and the inflation measures are for Scottish ministers, and any changes will be made by regulation using the affirmative procedure before the review commences. It follows, of course, that the Scottish ministers could not carry out such a review without consulting others and taking appropriate professional and expert advice nor could they lay the necessary regulations to make any changes without demonstrating that proportionate and relevant consultation had taken place. Having said that, I can understand that making express provision on the face of the bill would formalise these matters, and for that reason I'd be happy if the member were to press his amendment today. And I should mention uh, in passing that if the amendment is approved by the committee, the government will need to consider whether there are any drafting um, adjustments that are necessary in stage three in order to ensure that the provisions work properly, given the possibility of interim rate reviews in addition to rate reviews in the regular cycle of reviews. And this is as well as the need for the government to ensure that the overall wording and the structure of the provisions reaches the desired result in the best and also the clearest way possible. Does the member wish to press his amendment? Uh, yes, I do, can you? Um, the question is that Amendment 14 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Uh, and the second question on this is that um, schedule. Yes, the schedule be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Um, we now move to Amendment 12 in the name of Jackie Bailey and uh, Jackie Bailey to move and speak to Amendment 12. Thank you very much, Convener. Um, I'm happy to move Amendment 12 in my name. purpose of the amendment is very straightforward. Um, it's designed to give effect to the committee's recommendations in the Stage 1 report um, and it allows the pursuer's voice to be heard about their preference for either a periodical payment order or a lump sum and gives weight to their preference. Um, we debated this in Parliament and as I recall, I think both Angela Constance and myself raised this issue and the Minister helpfully said that she would reflect further on this. So the amendment is designed to tease out that, that reflection. Um, periodical payment orders I think are helpful, particularly in cases of personal injury, which tend to be catastrophic and have conditions which will therefore be lifelong for the pursuer. Um, and that continuing regular payment will protect ongoing costs. But that said, um, there will be circumstances where a pursuer really doesn't want a periodical payment order. They would prefer the lump sum. Instances like wanting to make a, a very large upfront capital investment in perhaps an adapted house. Um, and I don't want to see a circumstance, and I don't believe the committee did, where the pursuer was forced to have a periodical payment order. Um, they've taken a very long road often to compensation, particularly if there have been catastrophic injuries. Um, getting a positive decision and award at the end of that process can be very empowering. I don't want to remove that and disempower them at that very final stage because their views haven't been listened to. So this really is about ensuring that the court gives due weight um, to their preference. Thank you, convener. Um, John Mason. Uh, thank you, convener. And I should perhaps say that uh, I'm speaking here on my own behalf and not necessarily on behalf of uh, my colleagues. Uh, but I have to say I do agree with uh, Jackie Bailey's argument uh, for this amendment. I think uh, periodic payments are inherently good because they take away some of the risk that we've just been debating uh, for the last half hour and uh, give people uh, a, a constant um, income that they can live on and, and that's got to be inherently good when we're talking about vulnerable people. However, I think there are some exceptions. People, as Jackie Bailey has already said, may want a, a large capital upfront sum and the courts can split these as I understand it. Uh, but there's also the situation where uh, a pursuer wants a clean break from the defender and really does not want an ongoing relationship, even if that is uh, purely on a legal basis. Uh, I, th I think the word imposing a PPO does kind of get some of our backs up, that the court can do that. And I think we all know that the courts will listen to both sides. But I think it is quite good to specifically say that they must and it's not giving a veto to the pursuer, uh, but it is re-emphasising the fact that the pursuer's 
uh, desires and fears uh, should be seriously taken into account by the court. So if, if this amendment is pressed, I'm happy to support it. Uh, Angela Constance. Thank you, convener. I mean, I'm uh, on the record um, as being sympathetic uh, to what Ms Bailey is trying to achieve with her amendment. Um, I think we should be looking for um, extra uh, efforts or assurances within the bill uh, to ensure that uh, there is meaningful consideration given to the views uh, of the pursuer and that the court process uh, isn't uh, adding to that sense of powerlessness uh, that people who've uh, suffered a catastrophic injury uh, may well uh, um, feel. I suppose I am less prescriptive about how uh, that is achieved. I just want to see it in the bill in the best way so that uh, we're not um, uh, reliant purely uh, on the judiciary. Um, I think it is important that this is in legislation. The Minister gave a very clear commitment um, uh, during the stage one debate and actually followed that up um, in correspondence that she would indeed uh, be given this matter consideration prior to stage three. Um, I suppose what I would like to hear from the Minister today is just to flesh out um, how she will uh, consider that, uh, what is the scope of her considerations and how she will work um, with members across the political divide. Dean Lockhart. Thank you, Convener. Very briefly, I uh, understand the sympathy and the concerns expressed by Jackie ba Bailey and others. I have some concern about the wording of Amendment 12 and the fact that it would cut across uh, the court's discretion to decide the best form of payment, uh, which will be in the best interest for the injured party. Uh, perhaps instead of this being embedded in the legislation, this could be covered by the rules of court. Um, with regard to the wording, I have concerns in subparagraph B that uh, the, the statutory presumption will work unless the court considers that there are compelling reasons not to do so. Uh, compelling reasons is legally a very high threshold to meet. And I think rather than this being a presumption in favour of PPO, it would almost automatically result in PPOs uh, unless compelling reasons were uh, uh, shown otherwise. So I think, I think I have concerns about the wording used in Amendment 12 at this stage. Um, if no other members wish to speak at this point, I'll offer the Minister the opportunity to respond. Thank you, Convener. And I'm grateful to Jackie Bailey for bringing forward this amendment. And during the Stage 1 evidence sessions, I listened to those who had raised concerns that the Bill did not provide the Court when considering whether or not to impose an order for periodical payments that should give precedence to the views of the pursuer. In the, stage, uh, the response to the Stage 1 report, I explained that I wasn't keen to fetter the ability of the court to make the best decision according to the facts and circumstances at hand. And I went on to say that because of the strong support expressed for an amendment, providing that the court should have regard to the pursuer's preference, that I would give this matter further consideration. And I appreciate from what I heard at Stage 1 that uh, not giving effect to the views of the pursuer can be disempowering to those individuals. And so having reflected further, in particular, on the position of pursuers in these type of cases and the importance of, I think, not adding um, additional distress in an already very distressing situation, I'm pleased to support the principle that underlies this amendment. However, we need to think very carefully about how this provision could best balance the rights of the pursuers and defenders when aiming to give preference to the pursuer's position. And so with this in mind, I would like to offer to work with Jackie Bailey ahead of stage three so as to settle with her the precise approach to be adopted in order to address this matter appropriately. I am sure that a revised version of the amendment in workable terms that we can all agree on could be devised for bringing forward at stage three. And so accordingly, I would ask Jackie Bailey not to press her amendment at this stage. Um, I'll turn to Jackie Bailey to wind up and to press or withdraw her amendment.
Thank you very much, convener. I think Angela Constance summed it up best for me when she said this needs to be in the bill so that it's absolutely clear. Um, and therefore, I think Dean Lockhart, with due respect, is, is wrong to say we could simply put it in guidance or in court rules. And my understanding of what the minister um, is offering is indeed to put it on the face of the bill. And on that basis, I will happily withdraw, work with the minister and indeed other members to make sure we get this right for stage three. Thank you, convener. Thank you. Is there any objection to Jackie Bailey withdrawing that amendment at this no. stage? Uh, none. Thank you. Um, we now turn to Amendment 8 in the name of Stuart Stevenson. And uh, at this point, I'll <coughs> invite Stuart Stevenson to move and speak to his amendment. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. Let me commence before I forget by moving uh, Amendment 8 that stands in my name. I spoke in a stage one debate on this uh, important piece of uh, uh, legislation and identified uh, a relatively small but I think important issue in relation to periodical payments. The uh, bill provides for uh, a, a more subtle and varied way of setting uh, periodical payments. Um, in the case of future pecuniary uh, loss, for example, with or without the consent of the parties. So there's important uh, duties that the court has to undertake. The court also will get re-engaged in the issue of uh, periodical payments uh, by the introduction of Section 2C to the Damages Act at 2A, where it may come back to the subject of uh, uh, periodical payments um, to vary previous orders. So it's quite important uh, that the whole issue of periodical payments be considered. There is also provision uh, in um, under 2C uh, for a scheme under Section 213 of the Financial Services and Markets Act. And of course, the ownership of schemes may well change uh, over the period over which periodical payments uh, might be made. They might be being made for 60 or 70 years. So there's a whole series of things that place, I think, uh, a significant duty on the court when deciding uh, that uh, uh, there is reasonable security of periodical payment to explain why they've come to that conclusion. Now, it may be that quite frequently they will simply point to the relevant following part of the, the Act, but given that there are private sector ways of securing periodical payments, I think it would be proper that the person who is likely to be in receipt of that periodical payment has the opportunity to understand why the court has concluded it would reasonably secure and out with the bill, but by other means, if it were felt in extremis necessary to challenge it, but also to allow their uh, representatives to have the opportunity during the court process to challenge it if they had doubts about the security of a periodical payment. That's the basis on which I bring forward my amendment, and I hope that colleagues around the table will be prepared to support it, as I have no vote in the matter. Well, um, thank you, uh, Stuart Stevenson. I wonder, before I ask other members of the committee if they have any questions, if I might um, clarify uh, or point out one or two things that I would appreciate clarification on. And I'm not, um, by doing so, disagreeing in principle with what Mr. Stevenson is saying. But uh, there are a couple of points. The first is that if a pursuer makes a periodical payment order application uh, on a certain basis, then uh, the assumption would be, would it not, that the uh, pursuer is satisfied as to the, the security of payment or perhaps not, and perhaps Mr. Stevenson could address that point in closing up, uh, winding up his remarks. But the second is more to do with the wording of the amendment and how it fits with the other provisions of Part 2, Section 3 of the bill before us. And uh, Mr. Stevenson did uh, allude to the fact that um, under Section 3, 2, 2C, 1, there is an assumption the court is required to make, and if the court is required to make an assumption that continuity of payment is reasonably secure, uh, I'm not sure how the court 
can be required to go behind that and give reasons for that assumption when the, the Act will require it to make the assumption. I do take the point on board that the court might make an order relating to a scheme that is not covered by the various uh, bodies or, uh, for example, the guarantee under Section 22C181. Uh, but I'm just wondering if the wording is quite right as worded uh, at this stage, and I wonder if Mr. Stevenson could could come back to those those two points. Uh, does any other member wish to uh, comment on this? Uh, if not, I'll turn to the minister and invite her to respond to this or comment on this. Thank you, convener, and I'm grateful to Stuart Stevenson for bringing forward this amendment. It is the case that courts do, as a matter of course issue opinions or notes to give the reasonings behind their decisions. And not only is this a long-standing practice of the courts, it is part of the right to a fair trial guaranteed by the European Convention on Human Rights in Article 6. In cases which fall within these provisions, it's likely that reasoning will be that the party funding the PPO will fall within the sources identified in the legislation as reasonably secure. And there has been no evidence to contradict that position. Nevertheless, there may be others whom the court is satisfied are reasonably secure, and so it will be important to expose the reasoning. I'm happy for Stuart Stevenson to press his amendment while reserving the possibility of bringing forward government amendments to make any necessary technical changes at stage three, three so as to ensure that his provision fully dovetails in with existing provisions. Um. Stuart Stevenson, uh, thank wind you up, press or withdraw? Uh, thank you very much, Convener, and you asked me some quite specific questions. I think uh, the important thing is that even where the pursuer is applying to the court uh, for a periodic order, as you referred to, that of course it is the court that is in control of the outcome. And in particular, if I look at uh, what is inserted in 2C at section 2, subparagraph A, they, for example, have the court specifies the method by which payments are to be made. So the court clearly has the control uh, over the way in which periodical payments will be made. It can, of course, at 2C, enable an application to be made to the court for variation of provision, but it doesn't require that to be done. So therefore, I think it's important right at the outset that there is clarity about the decision making uh, that is made uh, by the court in this regard. I think the minister helpfully pointed out that this is not a particularly novel provision requiring the court to explain its uh, workings, shall we say. Um, so on that basis, I'm, I'm certainly happy uh, to watch uh, what the uh, government might do by way of further modification of this provision at stage three, if that's uh, required. But I would like to press my amendment at this stage. Convener. So the question, the question is um, that Amendment 8 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. And the question is that Section 3 be agreed to is the next question. Are we all agreed on that? Yes. And I now call Amendment 15 in the name of Dean Lockhart, which is grouped with Amendment 16, and I'd invite Dean Lockhart to move Amendment 15 and speak to both amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Convener. I would like to uh, move both amendments. Uh, Amendment 15 is a probing amendment to ascertain the intended operation of this section. Amendment 15 seeks to clarify that the court may not award a further, in other words, additional lump sum when considering an application to vary the PPO, in other words, increase the size of the, original, the overall original settlement. This would avoid the risk of the court being asked to op uh, reopen the original settlement generally uh, when considering uh, how to vary the PPO award uh, in future circumstances. This amendment is not intended to stop the court from being able to award a lump sum instead of a periodic payment which might be required depending on the individual's uh, circumstances. The amendment is instead trying to clarify that the court cannot award a new lump sum over and above the quantum of the original award. This is important because otherwise the benefits of finality and certainty of, of damages uh, would be undermined. Uh, 
Uh, the single award concept is, is crucial for reasons of finality and certainty for both sides, the pursuer and the defender, and this provision in the bill would uh, create some uncertainty and leave open the potential for further lump sum awards to be reopened in particular circumstances. Um, the, there may be another way to address this issue by retaining the words in addition to but adding clarification at the end of the subsection to say that any payment of an additional lump sum shall not increase the quantum of the original compensation awarded. And I'm very happy to work with the Minister to clarify the operation of this subsection. Um, very well. Uh, does any member wish to speak on this particular amendment? If not, I will invite the Minister to respond. Thank you, Convener. And once again, I'd like to thank Dean Lockhart for providing a bit more detail about these amendments. On Amendment 15, it might be helpful if I first summarise how awards of damages for personal injury may be made. The method of award, that is a lump sum or periodical payment, are not mutually exclusive. So a pursuer who receives their award by way of an order or agreement for periodical payments would rarely receive their entire award in that way. At the point at which a settlement figure is agreed or ordered, the pursuer may already have experienced losses. For example, their past salary or past care or treatment and their settlement may include a capital sum to them to purchase a piece of equipment to assist them. Such payments would be paid in a lump sum and it would only be the future pecuniary losses which could be made in the form of periodical payments. Even just looking at those future losses, the award or settlement may provide for these to be addressed by a mix of lump sum and periodical payments. That flexibility for the courts is maintained in the bill's provisions which relate to the variation of periodical payments. And if we were to restrict or hamper that flexibility, it would mean that if a court were presented with evidence that a pursuer's losses have increased due to a change in the pursuer's condition, it would no longer be open to the court to award a lump sum in addition to the periodical payments as originally awarded. It would be restricted to a choice between varying the level of the periodical payments or replacing the whole of the periodical payments with a lump sum when increasing the level of compensation. Additionally, the court can only vary an order or agreement where there is actual change in the pursuer's condition and that change results in significant over or under compensation. Section 2F for orders and Section 2H for agreements do not permit the court to reopen the original award altogether. Therefore, the result of Amendment 15 would not be the right approach. Now, let me turn to Amendment 16. The bill does, of course, already include a causation link to the original injury on two fronts. The original court order must include provision which enables an application to vary in the future in the first place and any changing condition has to result in significant over or under compensation and the bill does not change the underlying principles in Scots law which require a causal connection between the injury and the loss for which the pursuer is to be compensated. So if the original order awarding periodical payments does not include any provision enabling variation in the future the court could not even entertain an application from either party to vary. Where the court enables the future variation in this way, it must specify which must occur be, um, excuse me, it must specify which must occur before an application can be made. So in doing so, the original court will be acting in light of and subject to the essential rule in law and there being a causal connection between the injury and the loss. Therefore, there is already a clear and necessary link between the original injury and the circumstances which may result in variation. And the link in the words at 2F3B2 to significantly, and I'm quoting, over or undercompensate the injured person, close quotation, also links the variation to the original injury and makes it clear that it must be a significant and not a trivial change to the pursuer's condition. In addition, the wording of the amendment refers to a change being attributed to the injury and it's not clear how this would work where the change is an improvement as that would not be attributable to the injury. 
Simply put, nothing more needs to be said in the bill to achieve what Amendment 16 seems to be designed to do. So the amendment is, in my view, not, not needed. And for these reasons, I would urge the member not to press either Amendment 15 or 16. And if they are pressed, I would ask the committee to reject them. Uh, Dean Lockhart, uh, wind up and press or withdraw, first of all, Amendment 15. Uh, thank you, Convener. On Amendment 15, um, I, I thank the Minister for, for clarifying the intended operation of how this section is intended to work. I think my concern relates to the drafting of this, this subsection, and I'm happy not to press Amendment 15 if uh, I can work with the Minister to clarify wording which might address my concern uh, before Stage 3. Minister? Yes, I'm happy to do that. Thank you very much. Uh, with regard to Amendment 16, uh, the Minister slightly preempted my uh, um, arguments in favour of Amendment 16, but uh, she is completely right to say that causation is inherent uh, as an underlying principle of Scots law, and there has to be a link between the original um, a, uh, injury and the change in medical condition. My Amendment 16 was designed to uh, add to the provisions in Section uh, F, which already sets out uh, how and when a court can review a PPO. We heard evidence from stakeholders during the committee uh, session, uh, in particular uh, BTO solicitors, uh, that what is missing in uh, Schedule F or Section F is an explicit reference for the requirement for the change in condition to be the cause of the um, the, the additional uh, compensation. Um, so I would, again, I am happy not to press that amendment if I can work with the Minister to clarify that this uh, underlying principle of causation is indeed embedded within the draft legislation at stage three. Minister? I think we have been quite clear that this amendment is not needed because it is already covered in the bill. Jackie Bailey wishes to say something. Else. I'm preempting your next question, convener. Well, you're going to ask if members are content. So well, I'll just wait for your question and then I'll... Indeed, the, the procedure has <laughs> slightly got um, out of sync here. I think, first of all, I have to ask members if they're content for Mr Lockhart to withdraw Amendment 15. No, I'm not content, convener. Um, I not would content. seek to move um, 15. I'm entirely happy with the Minister's response to that. So in moving 15, I'm inviting the committee to vote it down. Well, in that case, we will go to the question. The question is that Amendment 15 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. no. Um, show, of we, hands. show of hands, uh, please, for, for um, those who are for the amendment. Was that two? Three. 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 Sorry. Myself. And against. Against. And against <laughs> the remainder. The rest. Okay. And in that case, there are no abstentions. Okay, so, if you so I'll now move to Amendment 16 and invite Dean Lockhart to move or not to move. I will not move Amendment 16. Is there any objection to that amendment being withdrawn at this stage? Jackie Bailey. Yes, convener, I'm going for a clean sweep. I wish to move Amendment 16 um, on the basis that I'm entirely content with the Minister's response and therefore I would encourage the committee to vote against it. Very well. We'll move to a vote. Who is uh, for the amendment? Okay. Against the amendment? And that is no abstentions. We will then move to Amendment 9 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 7, and I'll invite the Minister to move that amendment formally. Moved. Um, in that event, the question is, is Amendment 9 agreed to by the committee? Yes. yes. And the, the further question is that Section 4 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. And I'll now call Amendment 10 in the name of the Minister, which is in a group on its own, uh, Minister, to move and speak to Amendment 10. Thank you, Convener. 
So during stage one evidence sessions, I listened to those who raised concerns about the costs involved should a pursuer return to the court in order to have an order for periodical payments varied due to a change in their physical or mental condition, which would result in them being significantly over or undercompensated by the damages being awarded for future pecuniary loss. When I attended to give evidence at stage one, I was asked if I would consider whether I could commit to ensuring that those costs fall on defenders, as this was regarded as a fairer approach. And I undertook at that point to look at the interaction between the civil litigation legislation, which was passed earlier this year, and how that interacted with the damages bill. Whilst this issue did not feature as either a conclusion or a recommendation in the committee's stage one report, the matter was raised again during the stage one debate. And as I indicated in my recent letter to the committee, I agree that the right approach here is to ensure that where such proceedings are raised, the pursuer should continue to receive the protection of quant qualified one-way cost shifting, or quocks as it's known, as that is in the spirit of the 2018 legislation as it relates to personal injury actions. So Amendment 10 will therefore replicate the protection of quocks as provided for in the 2018 Act, but adapted for applications relating to the variation or suspension of an order for periodical payments. This means that regardless of who raises such proceedings, be it the defender or the pursuer, the pursuer will not be required to meet those expenses. Where parties have agreed periodical payments without recourse to the courts or have settled an action through an agreement and a subsequent action relating to variation or suspension arises, the same default position will apply. That is, the pursuer will be protected by quarks unless the agreement provides differently. And in this way, the amendments will not interfere with what has already been agreed between the parties. The protection will extend to proceedings where the injured person is represented by someone such as a guardian, or judicial factor, or acting under power of attorney. In those cases, the proceedings may not be in the injured person's own name, and I move Amendment 10, Convener. Thank you, Minister. Um, before other members may wish to come in on this, um, I wanted to raise uh, a point about drafting and the, the form in which this amendment takes. So putting to one side the principle, which as the Minister, as you correctly say, brings this area of periodical payment orders in line with the Civil Litigation uh, Expenses and Group Proceedings Scotland Act 2018. Um, I, I suppose this may be a question for members of your team to explain the, the base on which this has been approached. But my, my question is why this has not been done as a simple um, addition that is an, an amendment to the Civil Litigation Act 2018 where all of the other expenses um, rules are contained relating to quarks in, the, in this area uh, rather than being put in as an amendment to the Damages Act 1996 which is becoming a rather clumsy beast after 20 years of amendments and use. So, uh, Minister, uh, you can perhaps come back to that, because at the minute I'm not persuaded this is the best way to do it. And perhaps I should just um, clarify that, sorry, I, I, I should just clarify that it might perhaps be easier dealt with by simply putting into Section 8.2 uh, a subparagraph C, which includes then any application for variation of an order uh, suspension of, uh, that is, of a periodical payment order, suspension of a right in relation to, to such an order, or an appeal in relation to any such order, because then that would be in the 2018 Act, rather than having to reproduce um, what are quite lengthy provisions about um, this in a completely different Act altogether. So uh, I'm happy for you, Minister, to intervene, perhaps clarify that. Yes, I thank you uh, to the convener for raising this, and I think it is um, important that I perhaps put a few um, notes on the record about why it's been done in the way that it has. So the government gave careful consideration to how best to deal with um, quarks um, in a new section at 2J as contained in the amendment. And um, whilst I accept that the section 2J for quarks is quite long, it is necessarily long in order to cover the details required in the context of the other provisions regarding periodical payments. 
Um, however, the main rule is captured succinctly in subsections 1 and also in 2. And my view is that it's worth stating here for reading right alongside the other provisions on periodical payments. And this allows the provisions on periodical payments, including as quarks operates in connection with them, to stand as a complete set, as one single package. The remaining details are narrated in subsections 3 to 9, partly by freestanding propositions and partly by referring to the civil litigation legislation where it is appropriate. And there's no neat way of shortening this, at least not without compromising on the absolute clarity needed in the context of the provisions for periodical pay payments. So no matter how it's done, the essence of subsections 3 to 9 is essential for everything to work as it is intended to do. And for example, the precise proceedings to be covered by the rule in subsections 1 and 2b, what the rule is subject to in two different situations, and how to properly tie up in with civil education legislation where this is required. Critically, the rules stated up front in subsections 1 and 2 cannot be missed. And moreover, I would suggest that these key subsections are pretty simple on their own terms for the reader to follow. And I hope that answers your question, convener. Yes, I'm not sure that answers my question because if one looks at the Civil Litigation Act 2018, one sees fairly detailed provisions in Section 8, and I'm not persuaded that the, the drafting set out here is necessary. But Jackie Bailey wished to come in. Um, I'm not going to uh, argue about drafting. Um, I will stick to the principle of this amendment. Um, and can I very much welcome and support the amendment in the name of the minister? Um, I raised this during the stage one debate. She promised to reflect on it. I'm delighted she's done so and agree with the approach taken. So I will be supporting it when we come to taking a decision, convener. Very well. Any other member, if no other member wishes to speak? Um, I'll just ask the Minister to wind up. Thank you, Convener. So just to reiterate the point that the Convener raised, the approach that the Convener set, uh, set out is not one that we wanted to take. We wanted to do it specifically in this way. So I hope that does answer the Convener's uh, question. Well, very well, thank you. Um, in that event, we, the question is that Amendment 10 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Um, well, I think there's a no, so we'll go to a vote. Those agreed in favour, against, and those abstaining. And I think the final question then uh, with the Minister, sorry, it's not, it's not the final question. <laughs> the next question is that sections five to nine be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. And another question is the question that the long title be agreed to. Are we agreed to the long title of this bill? Yes. Thank you. And uh, that ends stage two consideration of the bill. So thank you to the Minister and her team. I'll suspend briefly before we move into the next uh, section to allow the Minister and her officials to leave. We now turn to 
um, item three on the agenda, which is to do with the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018. And we are looking at the Insolvency EU Exit Scotland Amendment Regulations 2019, which are made under the powers conferred on the devolved authorities in terms of the Act I've just mentioned. Under the protocol between the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government, the Committee is required to consider whether the procedure attached to the SSI is appropriate or should be changed. This instrument is subject to the affirmative procedure, which reflects previous practice for instruments in the area of cross-border insolvency, which make changes to primary legislation. Is the Committee content that this Scottish statutory instrument is subject to affirmative procedure? Uh, Mr. Mason. Yeah, just by, by way of comment, my understanding is here that today we're purely looking at whether it should be affirmative procedure and we're not looking at the content uh, of what's going to happen later. So on these grounds, I'm happy to support uh, mm -hmm. this. Yes, this is purely to do with the procedure. Um, so in that event, the committee being content, um, that is confirmed. I'll now suspend the session and move into, or suspend the meeting, move into private session.